So thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Nick, and I'm one of the events hosts here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming events um, on our website, pals.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on our social media channels via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Thor Hansen. He's a conservation bi biologist, Guggenheim Fellow, and award-winning author of Buzz, Feathers, The Impenetrable Forest, and The Triumph of Seeds. In his latest work, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, Hansen tells the fascinating story of how plants and animals are responding to climate change, adjusting, evolving, and sometimes dying out. A natural history story of hope, resilience, and risk Hurricane lizards and plastic squid is also a reminder of how unpredictable climate change is as it interacts with the messy lattice of life. So uh, this evening's event will also include an audience Q&A. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question, as well as if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting Thor and Pals by purchasing a copy of his book from us. A link to buy Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, along with Thor's other books, will be shared in the chat a couple of times tonight. So, all right, Thor, we're thrilled to welcome you, and thanks so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Nick. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks to everyone at Pals for inviting me to, to uh, speak this evening and thanks to all of you for logging in. I'm sure we would love it if we could all be in the same room together for this reading, but that time will come again uh, sometime soon, we hope. And in the meanwhile, we can thank the Zoom gods for this virtual opportunity. I want to jump right into our topic this evening by uh, showing you what I think is a very familiar, even iconic image about climate change. It is the polar bear stranded upon a melting iceberg. Now this has become our go-to symbol for the biological impacts of climate change, so much so that the conversation too often stops there. In the media and all kinds of public discourse, we, we invoke the poor old polar bear and then we move on. The conversation moves on overlooking a rich and vital biological backstory that is really at the heart of all climate change scenarios. After all, what matters is not so much the change itself as the response to that change. If every species got along just as well under any kind of conditions, why changing the weather wouldn't matter in the slightest. But of course, that's not how nature works. The diversity of life on earth is a result of specialization, the accumulation of species that are adapted to particular sets of environmental conditions. And when those conditions change, those species react. And it is the sum of those reactions that will determine the future, theirs as well as our own. So this evening, I want to focus on the challenges that climate change creates for plants and for animals and how we can go out into nature right now and already see and measure their responses playing out in real time all around us. We won't be talking very much about the process of climate change itself, the atmospheric stuff, uh, with one exception, carbon dioxide. Has there ever been a substance so often invoked and so seldom explained? When I started this project, I realized that I really didn't know that much about the substance that was causing the planet to warm in the first place. Now, I do remember from my high school chemistry textbook that they showed carbon dioxide as a big black ball in the middle, which was the carbon atom with uh, two red balls on either side, the oxygen. Uh, atoms. And I remember at the time thinking that it looked just like the uh, face and head of the red-eyed fruit flies that we had spent the last semester studying in biology. And that association stuck with me through all the years. And when CO2 became notorious for its connection to climate change, all I could picture 
was the, uh, the tailpipes and smokestacks of the world spitting forth these clouds of tiny flies, which was a very vivid image, but not exactly helpful in explaining the science. Because carbon dioxide is something of a paradox, isn't it? It is a global threat, but at the same time, it's one of the building blocks for life on Earth. It is everywhere in the atmosphere, which explains why it was the first atmospheric gas ever to be isolated and described. In fact, before the discovery of carbon dioxide, scientists weren't even sure if the atmosphere contained anything measurable at all. And that discovery rests in large part with this fellow here, a fellow named Joseph Priestley, who lived during the 18th century. He was a friend of Benjamin Franklin. He was a clergyman. He was a, an accomplished chemist. He was just an all around polymath, incredible person. And he credited his discovery of uh, the, the, the qualities of carbon dioxide to the fact that he was, quote, living for some time in the neighborhood of a public brewery. There, he found quantities of this colorless and odorless gas uh, massing above the fermentation vats. And he was also lucky enough to find brewers who were patient, patient enough to let this eccentric scientist build scaffolds over the top of their brewing vats and then lower in all manner of experiments into that invisible cloud. He learned that it would snuff out a candle flame and that it was heavy that it would carry the smoke from that flame down toward the brewery floor. He saw that small animals and insects could not breathe in the gas, and he found that he could dissolve it in water, producing a fizzy beverage that he described as having a pleasant acidulous taste. Now that breakthrough earned him the prestigious Copley Medal from the, 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 uh, the Royal Society of London. And it earned quite a lot more from, for an entrepreneur at the time named Johann Schwepp, who read about that discovery, who copied Priestley's methods and founded the soda water and tonic company that still bears his name. Now, Priestley's work paved the way for a lot of other experimentation at the time. Tindley and others began to work on and experiment with this new substance. They learned that CO2 could retain heat and as early as the 1890s, they predicted that industrial activities were adding enough CO2 to the atmosphere uh, to warm the planet. Back in the 1890s, they knew this. Of course, that work was done in Sweden, uh, where the idea of warming the planet a few degrees was met generally with gusto. Uh, nobody saw that as a problem at all. In fact, they thought it would be handy for warding off the next ice age. So people have known for a long time that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas. And they've known that it had the potential to warm the planet. But none of that explains why some carbon dioxide is a threat and why some of it is benign. To get my head around that distinction and to get my hands on some CO2, I conducted a little experiment at home with my son, Noah, on various contents of our refrigerator. And I'd like to share that story with you now, come straight out of the second chapter of the book, which begins with a quotation that is attributed to, to uh, Galileo, who said, we must measure all that is measurable and strive to make measurable all that is not. It turns out that fermentation occurs in a lot more places than vats of beer. Yogurt and cheese makers call it culturing, but it's more accurate to think of it as a form of slow microbial digestion, a way for bacteria and other tiny organisms to extract and use energy from the foods they live within and around. Like any form of digestion, it is a process that produces waste. Luckily for food lovers, the byproducts of fermentation include things like alcohol, thus the beer, and lactic acid, which adds tanginess and pungency to such cultured favorites as kimchi and buttermilk. Most fermentation also produces carbon dioxide, which is what had me combing through the back reaches of our refrigerator. A container of organic sauerkraut advertised probiotic punch and claimed it's alive. But any organism that kraut might have once contained had long since shuffled off their mortal coils and were no longer producing carbon dioxide. 
a lit match held above the briny mix burned brightly. Experiments with yogurt and sour cream were similarly disappointing, but then we hit the jackpot. On the bottom shelf, behind the bags of carrots and celery, sat a half gallon jar of homemade pickles. They had been stewing in their own juices since August and tasted yeasty as well as sour, suggesting that fungi had also joined the bacteria in their digestive pursuits. Frankly, it was far past time to throw the pickles out. But for once, procrastinating a chore had paid off. As soon as Noah and I brought a match near that opened lid, the flame demonstrated why carbon dioxide is such a common ingredient in fire extinguishers. With no oxygen to burn, the match went out in an instant, as if we'd turned off a switch. What's more, smoke from the snuff, snuffed tip curled downward, trapped in the gas just as Priestley had described. It's pouring down the side, Noah exclaimed, watching as wisps of smoke followed the heavy vapors over the jar rim and down to spread across the countertop. That's it, I told him. You saw the carbon dioxide. He quickly brought me back to earth. I didn't see the carbon dioxide, Papa. I saw the smoke. But like Priestley before us, we could use that smoke to watch the gas, defining its boundaries as it flowed and swirled around the open jar. For a few minutes, our kitchen was filled with the thrill of discovery as we lit match after match, watching them snuff and smolder until all the carbon dioxide had dissipated into the surrounding air. Simple experiments often lead to broader insights and repeating Priestley's fermentation trick brought up an obvious question. Do pickles cause climate change? Does making beer? The answer, of course, is no. But understanding why some carbon emissions are harmless while others are not reveals a basic truth about climate change that we rarely stop to think about. In the case of our pickle jar, the carbon came from the cucumbers in the brine. And the cucumbers had gotten it from the air around our garden the previous summer. Like plants everywhere, their growth relied on photosynthesis, that leafy process of combining carbon dioxide and water with energy from the sun to create starches. In other words, carbon dioxide puts the carbo into carbohydrates. When those starches break down, the carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. This is the step in the Earth's carbon cycle with which we are most familiar, because we play a role in it every moment of every day. Whether we eat plants or eat animals that have eaten plants, the energy that fuels our bodies traces right back to those photosynthetic starches, and we release carbon dioxide with every exhaled breath. But in terms of climate change, breathing is like making pickles or brewing beer, guilt-free. That's because our bodies are just one short stop for carbon on its continuous circuit from the air through plants and animals and back again with no net gain or loss. If that's all there was to the story, then the planet wouldn't be warming and I wouldn't be giving this lecture. The reality of modern climate change hinges on one key fact. Not all plants break down. Consider the pickle. Cucumbers eaten fresh or left to rot in the garden release their carbon right away. But that process slows considerably in a jar of salty brine. Under the right conditions, it can stop altogether. In nature, this occurs primarily in two locations, the ocean floor and boggy wetlands. When marine algae die in mass and sink to the seabed, they sometimes get buried before they are eaten or decomposed. Dead plants in bogs can also accumulate with little de decay, forming layer upon layer of peat. In either case, if sedimentary rocks form above and around those organic deposits, their carbon is effectively trapped and removed from the atmosphere for millions of years. It builds up. Transformed by heat, pressure, and age, we recognize these ancient plants now as the fossil fuels. Petroleum from the algae, coal from the peat, and natural gas, which can come from either. Burning them returns all of that stockpiled carbon dioxide to the air at once, overwhelming the natural cycle and leading to the many consequences now unfolding. So the next time you see something at the back of your fridge that looks like a scientific experiment, it is a scientific experiment. There's a lot to be learned 
in the refrigerator. And it's a good reminder that even the atmospheric aspects of modern climate change are rooted in biology. So we know that the climate is warming and we know why, but what does all of that mean for plants and animals? As you can imagine, this is a booming field of study. Climate impacts in nature are now so widespread that it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that all biologists are studying climate change. Some of them just don't know it yet. It helps to organize that deluge of information into themes. And one of the most common themes has to do with timing. At Walden Pond, the violets and wood sorrel that Henry David Thoreau admired in May and June now bloom by late April. And what he called that early yellow smell of willows can reliably be savored in March. Spring is arriving earlier and earlier. You can see it happen in your own backyard. And if you write your observations down, as Thoreau did, they might one day become valuable. His meticulous notes on the plants and birds he saw at Walden are now a vital baseline for modern comparisons. One expert told me that if Thoreau was listed as a co-author, on all of the papers now using his data, he would be one of the most prolific climate change scientists of the 21st century. But a modern spring isn't just earlier than what Thoreau saw, it's different. To Thoreau, it might seem like a season in disarray. That's because not all species are responding in the same ways or even at the same times. This little wildflower is a familiar spring site in meadows throughout the American West. It is known as death camas. Like many plants, it produces toxins to ward off would-be attackers. But unlike most other plants, it doesn't just put those chemicals into its leaves or into its seeds and other places that are likely to be nibbled. It puts them everywhere, including in its pollen and into its nectar. What's more, the main toxin in that mix, zygosine, is especially nasty stuff. It attacks the heart, it attacks the lungs, and for good measure, it attacks the digestive tract. Its Latin name really says it all. Toxicoscordion venenosum venenosum. Poisonous bulb, poisonous, poisonous. So death camas is well protected. But in terms of pollination, it's in a bit of a bind. I mean, how do you attract insects to your flowers when instead of a tasty reward, you're offering them seizures, paralysis, and well, death? Enter the appropriately named death camas bee. One of only a handful of species and the only bee that has figured out the trick of detoxifying death camas poison. Now that gives the bee an exclusive source of pollen and nectar. Nobody else wants this stuff. And it gives the flower a dedicated pollinator. It's a very tight, specialized, co-evolved relationship. But in many locations now, death camas blooms weeks earlier than it did just 30 years ago, responding to the steady rise in springtime air temperatures. The bee, on the other hand, nests in the ground where things are warming more slowly. And it appears to still be on the old schedule. If that trend continues, it will lead to what biologists call a timing mismatch, where different responses threaten to separate or decouple the partners in a critical ecological relationship. The flowers too early for their bee, the bee too late for its flower. Now, specialized relationships of that kind, like pollination, are particularly vulnerable to timing problems, but Mismatches have been cropping up in all sorts of scenarios. Caribou migrating towards their calving grounds and arriving there past the peak of the vegetation that they had walked all those hundreds of miles to reach, to eat, to gain energy, to raise their young. Or birds in migration, shorebirds that time their arrival at particular mudflats uh, to hopefully eat the invertebrates that are prolific at that time, missing out now in many cases, the timing is off. But it can take years really, or decades to really understand how those mismatches form and how they're going, how they're going to play out over the long haul. There are other climate change challenges that are very immediate, very apparent extremes 
in weather, which we have experienced here, of course, in the Pacific Northwest with our heat waves during this summer, unprecedented. All of these weather extremes from storms and the floods to the droughts or simply high temperatures. As one expert told me, it's, it's pretty simple sometimes, organisms just get too hot. And one example of that comes to us from the deserts of the American Southwest, where you might think that creatures would be pretty well prepared for a warmer future. Now, Barry Sinervo did this work. He is a herpetologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and he studies lizards, uh, including this one, the Western fence lizard, which if your childhood was anything like mine, you may have tried and failed to catch because the lizards invariably would scamper under a nearby rock before I could grab them. Well, it turns out that fence lizards use rocks for a lot more than escaping enthusiastic young lizard hunters. Uh, they are what biologists call heliotherms. They use the sun, helio, to warm and their bodies and regulate their temperature. So they bask on tops of rocks when they need to warm up, and when they get too warm, they cool off in the shade beneath the rocks. They can't stay out in the sun because their bodies alone have no way to compensate for that increasing heat. They would overheat and perish. So they must stay relatively close to a rock uh, so that they can cool off when they need to. And as the temperatures have risen throughout the Southwest, particularly in some of the desert areas and these prime reptile habitats, the lizards have responded by doing what they've always done on warm days. They've spent more time in the shade, but that comes at a cost. Because the more time you spend hiding underneath the rock, the less time you have to go out looking for food. So as temperatures have risen, the number of calories taken in by lizards has started to go down. And Barry and his team had watched these fence lizards, pop, these populations wink out in several hot locations uh, before they finally realized it wasn't the heat killing the lizards directly. What was happening was that they were spending so much time in the shade that they weren't getting enough to eat. And the females particularly were not able to build up the energy reserves required to reproduce. So in the short of it, the, uh, as, as temperatures rise, the lizards stop breeding. And it doesn't take a PhD in herpetology to predict the long-term consequences of that. Now, another climate change challenge that uh, occurs often in nature uh, is the, the absence of what you know, fans of the Jungle Book might call the, the bare necessities, if you will. Uh, the bare necessities of life. What happens when one of these bare necessities simply goes missing? from your habitat. And that, of course, is the conundrum faced by polar bears, where as the, uh, that polar ice disappears, the bears lose the area where they hunt for seals. It is a bare necessity, if you will, of their lives to have that hunting grounds. And when it's gone, they're in a fix. But the loss of Arctic sea ice affects more than polar bears. If you could look beyond the edges, of that ice flow, you might catch a glimpse of this little creature here. A lovely little seabird called the little auk or dovekey that feeds in the plankton rich waters right along the edges of those ice flows. And that strategy worked very well until the ice began to dwindle and began to retreat from places like Russia's Franz Josef Land archipelago where the dovekeys breed. And scientists long predicted that dove keys would be an early casualty of climate change. Because as the ice retreated, they would have to fly farther and farther and farther from their nests to reach the places where they feed and then bring food back to their chicks. They predicted this would eventually lead to starvation and population collapse. Which brings us though to an important point. Nature is not defenseless. Nature is not a passive bystander to climate change. When the climate warms, species react, and sometimes in ways that we cannot predict. So let's catch up with the story of dove keys uh, straight out of the book and a conversation with a French scientist named David Grimillet, uh, who participated in an expedition to a remote dove key breeding colony 
in Franz Joseph Lahn. We had indeed strong hypotheses and predictions on how they would behave, Gremillet explained, noting that birds in their previous studies had regularly flown over 60 miles just to reach the edge of the pack ice. We were expecting flight times between the colony and the foraging spot of at least an hour, he went on, and then recounted what he called, quote, one of the most exciting moments of my research career. Sitting with their laptops at the dinner, state, at the dinner table in the research station, surrounded by their Russian counterparts, they opened up the first batch of tracking data and saw precisely how long the birds had been in the air. Less than four minutes. Instead of trekking all the way to the edge of the sea ice, the Dove Keys had apparently found an alternative food source right on their doorstep. But what and where? It's easy to imagine the excited conjecture and conversation that must have come next, perhaps fortified by a sip or two of vodka. Soon their ideas began to coalesce around an entirely new hypothesis. My colleague, Jerome Fort, remembered what we had seen while climbing the nearby mountain with our Russian friends a week before, Gremillet recalled, and described a distinct line across the mouth of the fjord where cloudy blue meltwater from island glaciers slammed into the dark, dense currents of the Arctic Ocean. Both Fort and Gremillet had trained as oceanographers before they began studying birds, so they understood the consequences of such an abrupt transition. We both knew what this front meant, a curtain of plankton killed by temperature and osmotic shock. For tiny crustaceans, swimming so suddenly from one kind of water into another was like driving full speed into a wall. And for anything that fed upon those crustaceans, the resulting pileup was a bonanza. Testing their theory, however, required a boat, and the only craft available at the research center was a, quote, chronically deflated dinghy. And the fuel that they had brought from Murmansk turned out to be contaminated with water. Nonetheless, they set out, and they got this sputtering engine to go long enough to get out into the fjord for a survey. There wasn't much to see at first, but as they crossed that convergence zone between glacial melt and ocean water, the dove keys were suddenly all around them. The little auks were there, Gremillet told me, aligned on the oceanic side, diving and stuffing themselves on plankton, easily picked from that underwater curtain. So with that revelation, the story of dove keys and climate change switched from one of decline into one of resilience. Yes, the sea ice was melting as predicted, but so were Arctic glaciers. And in places like Franz Josef Land, where glaciers are plentiful and close to the water, that created an opportunity that no one saw coming. Gremillet and his team spent the remainder of their field season showing that dove keys weren't just surviving on their new fruit food source, they were thriving. Chicks grew at precisely the same rate as they had on a traditional diet measured decades earlier at the same location. To Gremillet, the project demonstrated how one overlooked detail can have a huge effect on the outcome. Even if you think that you know, he summarized, you really have to get out into the field to check what wild creatures are doing because they very often surprise you. Now, Gremillet's story really embodies something that I heard again and again during my research for this book, how scientists went into the field expecting to study one thing and ended up studying something else because conditions on the ground were so different from what they expected. Different in terms of climate, but also different in terms of the lives and the activities of the creatures and plants that they went there to study. The dove keys were able to pivot quickly to a new food source because they have what scientists like to call plasticity. You can think of it like good old plastic man, that uh, old superhero who could stretch his body into any shape. Well, we should wish that all species were like plastic man in this time of rapid change because that flexibility allows a rapid response. And the species that have more flexibility are in a much better position to survive during this crisis. And if there were an Olympics of plasticity, uh, there is one species that might take the gold because it's not just using plasticity to change its habits, it's changing its whole lifestyle, even how it looks. And that is the squid from the title of the book, The Plastic Squid Itself. This is the humble squid, 
which virtually disappeared from traditional fishing grounds in parts of the Gulf of California during a series of marine heat waves. And the fishers there thought, well, that's it. It has gone off to find cooler waters elsewhere and we're out of a job. We're out of a job. That's what everybody thought until they went out and did some detailed surveys and found that the squid were still there. In fact, even more abundant than they had been before. Instead of departing, the squid had responded to heat stress by adopting a radically different life strategy. They matured and reproduced in half the time they ate different foods. They also lived only half as long. And under those constraints, their new adult bodies could reach only a fraction of their former size, too small to bite on the lures that had previously been used to catch them. The rapid downsizing fooled the fishers who had been dismissing the few that they could hook as juveniles or another species and just thrown them back. Now, most climate change responses that we have measured to date are more or less some version of the dove key or squid story. They are versions of plasticity. Uh, capabilities that were already baked into a species genetic makeup. But there are tantalizing signs now of evolution in response to climate change playing out rapidly. And one of the best comes from another lizard. This is from a small anole lizard like this that grows, or that grows, that lives in the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean. And Colin Donahue, who is now at Washington University, had just surveyed this population of lizards as part of a, a, a larger study on the impacts of non-native rats that live on the islands. And the idea was you study the flora and the fauna, and then you go out and you remove the rats, and then you go back and see how rat removal uh, helped, hopefully, uh, creatures like this who uh, the rats were eating. So anyway, he just finished this whole survey uh, and then a hurricane struck and his research took an unexpected turn. So let's catch up with Colin's story from chapter eight of the book, which begins with another quotation, this time from Giuseppe Lampedusa's novel, The Leopard. And he wrote, if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. Actually, it was two hurricanes, Donahue clarified, when I called to ask him how the story played out. Hurricane Irma struck first, pummeling the Eastern Caribbean with torrential rains, storm surge, and category five winds exceeding 175 miles per hour. Just two weeks later, Hurricane Maria swept through with similar force. The combined storms devastated low-lying islands like the ones where Donahue's lizards lived uprooting trees, flattening structures, and leaving both natural and human communities reeling. Needless to say, researchers put the rat project on an indefinite hold. But for Donahue, that setback also offered an opportunity. While his questions about lizards and rats would have to wait, he was now in the perfect position to study the effects of hurricanes. Had any lizards survived? And if so, were, was the surviving population different from the one he'd just measured? We had no idea what to, suspect, to, to expect, he told me, but I knew we weren't going to get another chance at that kind of data. So he cobbled together some funding, headed back to the Caribbean, and found himself in a sort of scientific deja vu, repeating the exact same field project that he'd just completed six weeks earlier. We were on a short timeline, so it was pretty much catching and measuring lizards all day long, Donahue recalled, but he described that trip with obvious pleasure, as if this were precisely how anyone would want to spend their time on a tropical island. In conversation, Donahue's enthusiasm for science borders on exuberance. He comes across as someone who probably keeps working and thinking long after other people might quit for the day and retire to the poolside bar. That may be why he recognized the potential value of returning so soon to resurvey his lizards. And it's almost certainly why it occurred to him to bring along a leaf blower. The customs officer was very confused, he said, and laughed out loud at the memory of trying to explain the science behind traveling with a large piece of landscaping equipment. We needed to know how the lizards behaved in hurricane force wind, he told me, 
It was entirely possible that they might run for it or hunker down in the tree roots. We didn't know. Since watching lizards in a real hurricane was out of the question, Donahue used the leaf blower to simulate one inside his hotel room. And I have to say, I wonder what the people in the next room thought about that. I mean, it's one thing if someone turns on the TV pretty loud next door, but a leaf blower, my goodness. At any rate, Colin was kind enough to uh, loan to me some pictures of that experiment so we can see precisely what he saw in that hotel room. And there it is, the lizard on a stick as the wind begins, and you can see the back legs starting to let go as the wind increases, and oh, there, the back legs completely off, and then up in the wind, flapping in the breeze, the whole body flapping until finally he can't hold on any longer. And you'll be happy to know that there's a soft net right off camera and all the lizards in the experiment uh, were unharmed and released back into the wild uh, within moments of this experiment. But this is what Colin saw. He saw the lizards grabbing, holding on tight with their front legs until they couldn't hold on any longer. And it explained to him precisely what he'd seen in his data. Because as they re-measured those lizards, they found they were indeed different. The survivors had larger toe pads for holding on more tightly, and they had stronger, larger front legs for gripping. And they also had, and this is an interesting part, shorter back legs. And Colin realized that's because when they're flapping like a flag in the breeze, they need legs that are smaller with less drag. So that gave those lizards an advantage. It was survival of the fittest in action. And when he returned to study the population later, he was able to show how those traits were being passed down to the next generation. And when he looked more broadly at lizards across the Caribbean, he found that wherever hurricanes had been more frequent in the past, lizards had those characteristics, larger toe pads, and stronger front legs and smaller back legs. He was able to document climate-driven evolution taking place, not over the course of centuries, but within a single field season. And climate change biology is full of those kinds of surprises. And I hope you will agree with me that there's a lot more to it than a polar bear on an iceberg. Now, we have been talking this evening about challenges like timing problems and the extreme weather. We've talked about responses, everything from plasticity to even evolution. And I have to tell you, we haven't even scratched the surface. Consider movement, which may be the most intuitive and straightforward response to climate change. Moving across the landscape or through the ocean to seek out the temperatures and other conditions with which you're familiar and used to. Scientists estimate that between 25 and 85% of species on Earth are now shifting their ranges in response to climate change, even at the low end of that estimate. That's a quarter of all life on the planet. So these climate-driven upheavals then are impacting where creatures exist, how they interact, it's changing all sorts of fundamental ecological processes from competition to predation, hybridization, parasitism, and yes, extinction. The mouse-like bramble key melomies recently became the first mammal species confirmed as a climate change casualty when all of its known habitat was inundated by sea level rise off the coast of Australia. So studying climate change biology doesn't make scientists worry less about the crisis, but it can help them to worry smart, allocating scarce resources to the species that need our help the most. That's important for research resources. It's important for policy resources. It's important for conservation. And it's also important at a personal level when we allocate our limited, our, our limited emotional capital. We can't worry about everything. That capital is limited too. So knowing the biology helps us to formulate our own response. Yes, climate change is a daunting crisis, but I argue that it deserves our curiosity as well as our concern. After all, it's hard to solve a problem if we aren't even interested in it. 
So in a moment, I do want to take your questions, but first, let me end with a passage that's straight out of the conclusion to the book, which also begins with an epigraph, this time from the bard himself, from Shakespeare's King John. He wrote, strong reasons make strong actions. I subscribe to a philosophy expressed to me by Gordon Orions, an eminent American biologist whose seven decade career has spanned everything from blackbird behavior to the evolution of fear. When asked what a concerned citizen should do to combat climate change, his response was immediate and concise, everything you can. In that simple phrase, Orions managed to capture both urgency and agency. The seriousness of the issue combined with the importance of taking action at a relevant scale. It's not a new idea. 19th century thinker Edward Everett Hale expressed something very similar in a verse conceived long before anyone was worried about their carbon footprint. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something, he wrote. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. The value of the advice from both Orions and Hale lies in their choice of the word can, a verb that is rooted in possibility and adaptable to any circumstance. It helps us to focus our energy on tasks immediately at hand, tangible things like how we drive, shop, eat, travel, protest, vote, dry the laundry, or even cut the grass. Naysayers will claim that taking personal action is trivial, an empty gesture in the face of a problem so large. But that position is wrong, and not just slightly wrong. It is the opposite of the truth. In nature, we have seen how the responses of individual organisms determine the fates of populations, species, and entire ecological communities. The same pattern applies to society. Addressing climate change requires a fundamental cultural shift in our relationship with energy from how we produce it to how much, of our, how much of it our lifestyles demand. That makes individual action more important, not less so, because it is the collective behaviors and attitudes of individuals that define and change a culture. Yes, we need stronger climate policies and strong leadership to carry them forward, but those things will be the results of cultural change, not the cause of it. Doing everything one can about climate change is also fitting biologically, because that is precisely what plants and animals are doing. Their responses are playing out all around us every day, a constant thrumming call to action. Because in spite of the complexity of our societies and the technologies that we surround ourselves with, in the end, we're just one more species on a changing world, facing the same climate challenges, and drawing on the same basic toolbox of potential solutions with one notable difference. Unlike any other organism on the planet, people have the ability to do more than simply react to climate change. If we choose, we can alter the behaviors that are causing it to happen. Thank you very much with that. I will be happy to take your questions and I think Nick will rejoin us for that portion of our time together. Hi. Yes, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so please, uh, please, everyone, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll read those. Um, for the first question here, we have from uh, Tova Danovich, um, who says, I'm curious when movement is one response to climate change, how scientists and environmentalists are going to deal with that as so many species are, are considered only native to X place. Are they invasive when they move? What will it take to accept plants and animals that are climate refugees as new native species? Oh, that's a marvelous question. Yeah. And for biologists, we really reserve the phrase invasive to things that people have moved around. So if those plants and animals are making those movements on their own, most biologists would tell you that we're going to have to learn to deal with them where they end up. But you, you ask a great question because we don't know how all of these things are going to play out. 
right? I talked to a wonderful scientist for this book, Greta uh, Peckel, who is down at uh, the University of Tasmania, one of the world's experts on, on species movement. And she told me, we, we had a great conversation, all of this stuff. And, and then I asked her a question very much like what you've just asked me, you know, what, what's going to happen when, you know, all of these novel ecosystems, if you will, all these species coming together that have not interacted before. And she said, yeah, she said, yeah, we know species are moving, but uh, what's going to happen? Well, we don't really have our shit together on that yet, <laughs> uh, which I thought was a great summary, uh, uh, you know, and a reminder that even the world experts uh, cannot predict everything that's going to happen because we are changing things so quickly and putting things together in ways where they have not interacted before. So it, it, expect the unexpected is the, is the lesson. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so let's see. Thus far, I don't have any other questions yet. So, you know, please, yeah, be uh, open and asking questions. Everybody out there, <laughs> well, we'd uh, glad to glad to read them, and he's glad to answer them for you. So, um, let's see. Oh. Um. I think we stumped him. Uh, if we got one more. Here's here's another one. So <laughs> <laughs> excellent. I'm glad to hear. So uh, Linda uh, Liu asks, it was recently announced that 27 species are now extinct. Are these a result are these a result of climate change? Oh, wonderful question. So the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service here in the States recently took 27 species off the endangered species list because they're considered extinct. So they shouldn't be on the list. We can't save them because they're gone. And it's a reminder to all of us that we are changing the climate and causing all of these stresses at a time when the environment is already under great stress from human activities. Because all of those species extinctions now um, are the results of things we've done in the past. And those are not considered necessarily climate-driven extinctions. You have creatures on there that are mostly extinct due to habitat loss, some due to invasive species, just to touch again on our, on our earlier question. But again, we are stressing an environment now that is already under duress from all of these human activities, particularly habitat loss, but the pollution uh, and the invasive species and the demand that we have for agricultural land, for forestry, for fishing, uh, all of these things that we extract from the, the environment have a cost. So it's a stressed system already, and now we're really putting it uh, to the test. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, Carol Barnes asks a question, maybe even more, uh, uh, Carol Barnes asks, what and when did science and biology spark a lifelong interest for you? Ah, <laughs> it's, I've been, I've been this way the whole time. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's been a lifelong passion, although I would tell you that I, I was, I wouldn't have considered myself necessarily headed towards a, a career in science even though I love the outdoors and always had, you know, snakes and lizards and, you know, fish and tadpoles and jars and all this kind of stuff. Um, it was more of an avocation than a vocation until I had a, a few experiences. Uh, when I moved away from the Pacific Northwest down, I went to school east of Los Angeles in a very developed area. And I realized that a lot of the nature that I had been taking for granted growing up in a, a more wild place, a more rural place, uh, was very threatened. It was gone in other places. There were, there were ecosystems there in Southern California that were virtually gone. Uh, and I, that awakened me to the threats of habitat loss and the need for conservation. And so what had been more of a, a, a hobby style of passion in those years transformed into something that would become a career in conservation biology. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're getting a bunch of questions, which is wonderful. Um, so, um, so Leslie Davis asks, 
What do you think of the work of people who are bringing indigenous perspectives to biology, such as Robin Wall Kammerer? Oh, vital stuff. I mean, the, the overlooked indigenous knowledge and, and the, the relationships that take, you know, a deeper perspective than we get from our several field seasons out, you know, studying something in science. And again, I'm going to go right back to that conversation with Greta uh, Peckle, who I talked with right after she had been visiting with uh, a group in sort of northern Finland, the Laplanders there. And she had this, she had just had this aha moment as a scientist, because the, the species that were moving into that area from the south were unfamiliar. And where, you know, as scientists, we have questions about, well, what's that going to do to predation and competition and so on and so forth. And for the people that she had just been living with uh, for some weeks, you know, they were looking at these species as strangers. These are not creatures that we have songs for. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't have a relationship with them. They're not part of our, our culture in this landscape. And that is a profound layer to add you know, to what we look at scientifically as this perturbation and this disturbance, it is a much deeper and more profound layer and one that we can add to all sorts of scientific questions, but it's very applicable to climate change with examples like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, over from the chat, I'm going to read this one. This is from Richard Parsons as a docent for, as a, um, actually, yeah, I'm going to read it. I'm not, I say, if Richard, he says, as a docent for natural reserve, I'm wondering what you might recommend, I say, to guests at the reserve to encourage or motivate them to be aware of, of climate change and possibly help adapt or re reduce the speed of climate change. Just kind of, that seems like a general, what can I do to help question. So, yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's a great question. And I think the, you know, the actions that we take are, are personal and there are many things that you can do. And I think of it, you know, in terms of, you know, as I mentioned in the conclusion, how we drive and how we vote and how we shop and eat and all of these things that we do on a daily basis, they matter, they're vital. And we make those choices with climate change in mind. And the analogy that I think of for myself and, and, and share with others is that when you're dealing with such a large project problem and you're, you're taking small steps, it's almost like when you have a friend who's going through a bad patch. You know, maybe there's an illness in the family or uh, you know, some real problem that you can't fix, but you want to help, right? You want to do something to help this friend of yours. And so you look for ways to help. Maybe you cook a meal and take a meal to the family right? Maybe you mow the lawn, maybe you go and do er run errands for them. And it's one little thing that they don't have to worry about. And it does help, right? It does help them, right? In a small way. But what it also does that I think is important is that it makes you feel better because you wanted to help. And by, you know, you did something and you feel better. And when you do something that makes you feel better, it is what we call in science, a positive feedback loop, right? We, if, if that makes you feel better, you want to do more of it. And so when we start with these small things for climate change, uh, you feel a little better and you want to do it again. And that feedback loop at a mass scale, at a population level, leads to real change. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read another one over here from the uh, chat. So um, this is from, looks like James. Yeah, James Casey asks, how might Thoreau have responded to climate change? And he puts trans transcendentalism and all that. Oh, Thoreau's response. I, yeah. I, I don't know philosophically how he would have responded, but I think he would have been amazed at the changes at Walden because you know, his observations were meticulous. You know, he noted when leaves came out on plants. He noted when they flowered. He noted when he heard the first songs of all the birds that came to the woods there. And he noted all this. This was not in his regular journals and all the published sort of information. If you recall the slide that I showed, it was laid out very much like a modern spreadsheet. I mean, it was absolutely organized and uh, it was never published. It sat in where well, it was divided. The bird stuff went to 
uh, I think over at some museum at Harvard and the plant stuff went to uh, a museum in New York City. I was back there, and nobody knew anything about it. Some, a few Thoreau scholars knew that he'd done this stuff, but the scientists had no idea. And it was a casual conversation between a scientist and a Thoreau scholar. So the scientist said, yeah, you're doing some veg vegetation plots out at Walden Pond. And, and the you know, Thoreau scholar, oh yeah, that must be really interesting related to all those notes that uh, Thoreau took back, back when. And the scientist said, what? What notes, you know? And so they got a hold of them and, and this now has become the baseline. Very few baselines from that era that are so detailed and so complete. So I don't know what he would have thought philosophically, but I do know that he would have been agog at all the changes because he had that baseline in his head from all of those years of observation. Sure, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I have um, we'll probably, let's see, I'm going to, let's ask one more over here. So Mary Ratcliffe wants to know, did your son help you with any more experiments when making this book? Oh, <laughs> yes. You know, he is a good, uh, is a good motivator for me. And there are a couple that he was definitely involved with. We went on a survey together for uh, Pisaster, which is a genus of starfish. If you've gone to the beach and you've seen the purple starfish or the orange ones and so on, these are in the genus Pisaster. And also a recent uh, casualty, not extinct, but heavily damaged by a climate influenced disease outbreak in the oceans here. And what struck me profoundly at the time was, you know, we had a habit, my son and I, of going to the beach and looking for these marvelous star starfish. And then this disease outbreak swept through and the starfish were gone. And if you've ever read classic uh, sort of ecology textbooks and come across the phrase, the keystone species, the keystone species, the, where that phrase was coined was Pisaster, the starfish, uh, study out on uh, Tatoosh Island here in Washington state. And they named them uh, Keystone because when they were removed from the ecosystem, there was so much change in the intertidal zone. They were so important mm. to that system. And that was the Keystone, the original Keystone species. And it struck me as amazing that my, at the time, nine-year-old son would have lived through such a profound ecological shift in his environment. Uh, truly remarkable. So we, uh, we did some, some surveys together went and found a place where the, where the starfish are still hanging on and were able to see them again. Uh, and it was just profound with someone so young to, for him to have, to be reliving a memory of a place, you know, in such a short span of years. But he was thrilled to see starfish again when we found uh, a surviving population. I love it, that's great. <laughs> Um, so I think we'll probably just end here. I have three people who basically just wanted to, uh, wanted to give you comments. So uh, just in general. So Priscilla Dean, just um, she ends with she's had a hard time thinking of question, but she says she's wanting to help and thank you for the quote, do what you can. I think she especially liked that. Um, Jamie Cura said, I want to thank you for this presentation. I read the overstory by, by uh, um, Richard Powers and found myself feeling deeply discouraged about the future. This has helped me feel more optimistic, she says. And then Les, um, Leslie Davis says, I can't wait to get the book. Thank you. And then Cherry, Grocer Cherry Gregory says, thank you, thank you, thank you. So you've got lots of people out there uh, <laughs> saying lots of, so rock on Thor, also James Casey adds. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess we'll probably, I guess we'll, we'll probably uh, go ahead and end there. And, uh, but just uh, thank you so much for that presentation, for those slides okay. and for all of that um, info and just giving us all of that food for thought. And so we appreciate that so much. <laughs> um, so uh, everyone out there, thank you for joining us as well. And please consider purchasing a copy of Thor's new book. Um, here, we got it right here. And um, um, you can get that off of pals.com. While there, be sure to check out our lineup of other upcoming virtual events. And we look forward to seeing you at another one of our events soon. And uh, once again, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Thor, for all of that. <laughs> so, thanks so much. Good night, everybody. Excellent. Good night, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>